you're going to have a lot to deal with soon. And, yes. and something that you're going to have to deal with very early on is the aftermath of the Harold Easter investigation, which is now yes. in the DA's hands. He has yes. the investigative file. Yes. The family tells me he begged for help mm -hmm. and initially did not get that medical attention. Is mm -hmm. that true? Well, you know, that's part of an SBI investigation. Uh, I, as you know, I can't comment on that. I uh, wish I could. Uh, there's a lot of things that I think we need to look at based on this incident. But I will tell you, what I will say is that uh, someone in our custody is in our care. And, uh, and, and we have a responsibility for that. Uh, not to say anything specific about the Easter case, but uh, I think that we do have to take a good hard look. And that's why the State Bureau of Investigation is, is doing the investigation. Have you seen the video? Uh, yes, I have. Are you comfortable with the way your officers handled that? Again, I, I'm not going to comment on the case spe uh, specifically. Uh, what I will tell you is that someone in our care is in, uh, someone in our custody is in our care, and we have that responsibility. So, and just kind of closing out on this topic. Yes, words are important. What you say today could yes. impact how the public responds. Yes, when everything comes out. Yes. Is there anything else you want to say to prepare the public for what this case will reveal? Uh, you know, I I think the public's expectation is that we are here to protect and serve and, and, and save lives when we can. And uh, uh, we're, we're held accountable for that. So whatever the investigation reveals and whatever comes out of that, uh, that's something we're going to have to take a hard look at and see what changes we need to make to policy, what things that we need to do uh, better to help serve and protect our people. And, uh, and, and you know, that's a big deal. And it's a big deal to us and it's a big deal to the officers that are in the street. They don't, they don't ever want to see uh, an incident where somebody's life is lost uh, while they're in our care. Your traffic stop data show that black men continue yes. to be stopped, searched, and arrested at a much higher rate than their white counterparts. Yes. Are you okay with that? You know, I, um, I understand it. I wish it was, I wish we could do better. And, and that's one of the things that I want to look at. And I'll tell you why, because we've always looked at uh, high crime areas and, and in those high crime areas and I've been guilty of it as a division captain years ago that we take a no tolerance approach to say uh, in these areas because they're dealing with certain criminal activity we're going to go in and we're going to make traffic stops we're going to uh, we're going to get out with people and, and make drug arrests we're going to do certain things to show our presence in those areas uh, but you know our presence does not have to be enforcement all the time. So, uh, so yeah, I think there's some things that we can do better and change that in that aspect uh, and, and try to work on down the road, so. And you said you wish you could do it, but you can. You're going to be the chief, right? So you're going to take some action. Oh, yeah. I, I, what I can do is have that direction to our officers and have those expectations laid out all the way down to the, to the officer that's doing the work. And I have to rely on them to, to uh, put forth my vision as well. So I can, uh, I think we hold those expectations out and uh, all the way from uh, deputy chiefs to, to captains and majors and lieutenants and uh, sergeants. So we have to have that expectation out there. In your 28 year career, how many times have you personally used deadly force? Me personally, I've, I've never used deadly force. Have you had a gun pulled on you before? I've had, uh, I've been fought, I've, I've been in, in tussles with individuals who have uh, pulled guns on me, uh, never pointed at me, never got an opportunity to point it at me. Uh, but in those struggles, I've been able to subdue, subdue those uh, individuals. Have you been in fear for your life on the job? Oh, absolutely. I, I think there are a lot of times when uh, you have no idea what you're stepping into and what you're, what's getting ready to escalate uh, at any moment. So uh, there, there have been plenty of times, especially with the work that I've done as far as uh, being a drug enforcement officer for a period of my career, uh, also being a homicide detective where I'm actually going out and looking and knocking on doors of people who may have been involved in a homicide as a suspect and you don't know what you're stepping into sometimes. So it is a, it is a very dangerous situation that you get put into. So how did you personally show restraint when other officers can say they fear for their life and legally kill someone. Yeah, you know, I, I've always been one uh, that has under the concept of just because you can do something legally does not mean you have to do something. Uh, in the situations that I've been in, uh, there were, there was, I could have easily res responded with 
uh, deadly force uh, in, in those deadly force situations. I could have responded with deadly force, but uh, you know, I've been fortunate to, to be able to subdue them physically without having to be put in that situation. And, those, uh, and to be honest with you, uh, these things happen so fast uh, that my reaction was, was to uh, avoid the use of that weapon against me uh, but at the same time, you do always have to look back and say, was that the right thing? You know, should I have done this and should I have done that? Uh, and, and that's always important to critique yourself as well when you're in those situations. There's a picture circulating of you on one knee with your fist in the air. Yes. Obviously, nowadays, gestures mean more than anything. Yes. What were you trying to say with that gesture? You know what? I was, um, I was welcome to that march. And I think that, and like I said, anytime I'm welcome somewhere, I'm going to show up. And, and, and that was in solidarity, solidarity against what happened in Minneapolis. And, um, you know, my thoughts on that were I haven't t spoken or talked with any officer or any police chief anywhere in the country that's okay with what they saw in Minneapolis. So my gesture was simply a solid show, show of solidarity that, uh, that we don't agree with this either. You know, people, people have to realize that when we saw this as police officers, it, it made us sick to our stomachs also. And that's all that was. And, uh, you know, I hope that people understand that that's what, what my goal was to say that, hey, we're here with you. We disagree with that as well. And we're looking to improve and get better as well from that. You saw what happened in Wilmington earlier this week with yes. the officers. Yes. What are you doing to weed out overtly racist police officers in your department. Yeah, you have to identify them first. I think what happened in Wilmington, that, that to me, that is not something, that wasn't the first time that kind of language was used by those officers. It, 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 you, that's not something that just starts uh, out of the blue. So uh, we have to be able to identify those initially. We don't even want to hire officers that have those biases coming in. So we do have screenings with, uh, uh, with um, implicit bias and, and also with uh, uh, psychological uh, evaluations of the officers before they get in. However, it's not a perfect system, it never will be. So when we see that happening and we identify that, we have to take action quickly uh, and swiftly and uh, to ensure that we're not putting those officers in, in, out in public in contact with our citizens. Even before George, warning date, I'm sorry. thank you. Even before George Floyd's murder, the NAACP here tells me that communication was shut down with them. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to try to improve communication with this key stakeholder? Yeah, yeah. I, I think we have to uh, have an understanding, and I, I have a good relationship with the NAACP in the fact that we know that there are going to be differences and disagreements. Uh, however. Uh, we know that we also have the same goal that we need to work together because we both, our interest is to make our community safer uh, and, to, uh, and to make sure that, that as far as the police are concerned that we're treating everybody fairly and with respect. Uh, so that's our challenge uh, that, that uh, we come together and we can set a good example for the entire community that whether you disagree or not, you know that you can work together in, in, for a common goal. Civil Service Commission, um, Citizens Review Board, are you comfortable with how those groups are made up? Do you feel like they have too much oversight or too little oversight? No, I think we can always improve on all of that. I, I don't, I think they, uh, again, they have, uh, they have, I have much respect for the, the uh, for both boards. Uh, and I think that they do great things to help us uh, stay accountable and to, to, for oversight on some of the decisions and things that we make. Uh, I've, I feel like that, uh, our relationship is strong and it's going to get stronger uh, and we're, we, again, it's just like the NAACP that we spoke of, uh, we have a common goal. We want to make our department better and they're going to be part of that. Can you tell us what CMPD bought with the RNC security grant? I cannot, no. Why not? Yeah. Well, uh, right now that, that deals with uh, specifics as far as security measures with, uh, with the control of the RNC. Uh, and that information is generally released, it, just like the DNC, it's released after, uh, after the event is over. So at this point, it's, a, it's, it's not only just tactics, but equipment and things that we have. It goes into the security plan, and that security plan is highly confidential.